Thanks, Brett. Uh, morning, everyone. It's nice to be presenting on this cold load shaded morning. Um, yeah, as Brett said, I will be talking about hypothyroidism in pregnancy. And as you all well know, hypothyroidism is a tricky beast at the best of times, but add pregnancy into the mix and it can be very difficult to manage. To start off, we need to cover thyroid physiology in pregnancy. So if you're doing part ones, this is a nice refresher. So meet the thyroid. Uh, thyroid hormones are critical uh, determinants of brain and somatic development in infants and of metabolic activity in adults. So without your thyroid hormone, you wouldn't get to the point where you can walk around and hold a balloon or to the point where you can jog or run. But they also affect the function of virtually every organ system in the body. And some would argue that the thyroid is the king of hormones, but I'll let each specialty debate that um, at a different time. So looking at the thyroid, there are two main hormones, um, thyroxine, which is tetraiodothyronine, and then T3, triiodothyronine. The primary hormone is T4, um, which is secreted by the thyroid, and then lesser amounts of T3 are also released, but mostly um, converted from T4 in the peripheral tissues. Both hormones are iodine-containing forms of thyronine, um, which is derived from the amino acid tyrosine. And iodine is obviously essential for thyroid hormone synthesis. So to take you back to this picture, what happens is iodide is taken into the cell via the sodium iodine symporter. Um, thyroglobulin is synthesized in the Golgi apparatus from tyrosine, and it's then transported into the colloid. Um, iodide diffuses across the basal lateral membrane here um, and reacts with thyroglobulin with, uh, or, or via thyroid peroxidase. And iodide is then added to tyrosine on the thyroglobulin to form MIT, uh, DIT, T3 and T4. These hormones then stay attached to thyroglobulin until needed, so it acts as a reservoir. And basically, you could survive with a diet completely devoid of iodine for up to two months before you see a decline in circulating hormone. And then when needed, the thyroglobulin is endocytosed back into the follicular cell, and then active hormone is released into circulation. And the reason this is important is if you look at your iodine intake per day, in adults or in, in adults, the recommended iodine intake is 150 micrograms per day, but in pregnancy and lactation, this goes up significantly. The WHO actually recommends more than the United States Institute of Medicine, up to 250 micrograms of iodine daily. And the reason for this is that there's an increased demand for thyroid hormone during pregnancy. Um, there's an estrogen mediated increase in thyroid binding globulin. And because of the increased renal clearance of pregnancy, there's more iodine um, cleared by the kidneys. And then the fetus also needs some iodine to some extent. So looking at pregnancy and the thyroid, the thyroid increases in size during pregnancy, but goes up by about 10% in size in iodine replete countries, but 20 to 40% in size in iodine deficient or countries or areas. And iodine requirements, as I've shown you, increase by about 50%. Now this is important because if you look at iodine status, Oh, sorry, the power's just come back on and blinded me in my office. But if you look at iodine status, um, as you can see, most of the world is at adequate status. Some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, insufficient um, countries in, in Eastern Europe um, as well. But this data, it comes from between 2005 and 2020. And South African data is probably a bit lacking for the most recent years, except this study came out in the middle of last year um, from our colleagues across the way at Rahima Musa. And what they actually showed in 250 patients attending antenatal clinic there, um, based on the median urine iodine concentration, pregnant women in urban Joburg are probably borderline iodine deficient. So it's something to keep in mind in pregnancy and just to, to keep track of in terms of thyroid function in our pregnant patients. So based on those iodine requirements, it's obvious that thyroid hormone production increases by a similar amount. And there's also a physiologic rise in T3 and T4 during pregnancy. And that's due to two reasons. The one is there's an increase in thyroid binding globulin and there's TSH receptor stimulation by HCG. So thyroid binding globulin binds about 67% of circulating T4 and 45% of T3 with the rest bound to albumin and transthyretin. 
And thyroid binding globulin rises from about week seven, reaches a peak at week 16 of gestation, and then remains high until delivery. And this sudden, in, sudden sustained increase in thyroid binding globulin leads to a decrease in free hormone. And the decreased free hormone stimulates TSH secretion. So just to show that you've got your estrogen, increase, you have an increase in thyroid binding globulin production with a decrease in clearance, leads to an increase in total thyroid binding globulin. There's an increase in bound T3 and T4, which leads to an increase in T3, T4 production, an increase in total T3 and T4, but you maintain normal free T3 and free T4 because of this increased production to compensate for the increased binding. To show that graphically, as you can see here, your thyroid binding globulin increases and is sustained from about 16 weeks, and you have a similar rise and sustained increase in your total T4 due to increase in your estrogen. So looking at HCG-mediated um, stimulation of the thyroid, that's a representation of HCG and TSH. And as you can see, they have a, the same alpha subunit, but slightly different beta subunits. And as a result of that, one micro unit of beta HCG is equal to 0 0.0013 micro units of TSH. So, so there is some stimulation. And as you can see here, you have a rise in HCG spike, sort of the middle of the first trimester, then comes down. And to reciprocate that, you have a drop in your TSH, and then it starts coming up again in the second trimester. The question is, what's normal? Well, early studies recommended a lowering of your non-pregnant lower limit of normal of 0.1 to 0.2, um, and a 0.5 to 1 uh, milliunit lowering of your non-pregnant upper limit of normal. And so that would result in, your, this, is in this is TSH. So first, second, third trimester values as shown. What's important to note is you can have patients with a completely suppressed TSH. So as you can see, it gets quite low and no symptoms. And patients with super normal HCG levels will have lower TSH, such as in multi-gestation pregnancies. But a number of studies have been done. I'm just showing two here. The one is a UK-based study, 335 pregnant women. And as you can see, this is the reference range that they use in their um, non-pregnant population versus what they found in this group of patients. And this study done in Nanjing, China of 805 pregnant women versus 282 non-pregnant controls, you can see here the TSH in the non-pregnant controls, 0.76 to 4.88, and significantly lower in pregnancy in all trimesters. And the same for total T3 and T4. So ideally what we should be doing is we should have population and pregnancy specific reference ranges. We don't have that in our population and it's definitely um, something of interest, something that we should be looking at doing. But the American Thyroid Association in their 2017 guideline for thyroid disease and pregnancy recommended that from week seven to 12, you take a TSH, your non-pregnant lower limit of normal less than 0.4, your upper limit of normal less than 0.5. And that results in a TSH of 0.1 to four in your first trimester. And in your second, third trimester, you have a gradual return to non-pregnant ranges. So you can use those pregnancy specific ranges from other countries um, um, or just start looking towards your normal ranges. In terms of T3 and T4, now this is total, you have an increase from week seven to 16 of your upper limit of normal plus 5% per week. And your T3 and T4 from week 16, you take your upper limit of normal times 1.5. So just a refresher of that physiology, thyroid binding globulin, total T4 go up. You have an HCG, HCG spike, rise, slight rise in free T4, and then back down in the second and third trimesters. The reason this is important is that fetal TSH only appears between the 10th and 12th week of gestation. And fetal T4 synthesis begins around 18 to 20 weeks of gestation. So until about the middle of the second trimester, the fetus is entirely reliant on maternal thyroid hormones, um, mainly in the first trimester, but sneaking into the second trimester as well, if you look at when T4 is synthesized for the first time. So now that we've refreshed the physiology, what are the causes of hyperthyroidism in pregnancy? And as always um, with medical problems in pregnancy, the best way to look at it is non-pregnancy and pregnancy related. 
So non-pregnancy would be your non-HCG mediated um, causes of hypothyroidism and pregnancy related would be your HCG mediated causes. What are those? Well, non-HCG mediated, same as in a non-pregnant population, mainly Graves disease is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in women of childbearing age, and then a number of other causes. Rarer causes also include uh, TSH secreting pituitary adenomas, uh, functional thyroid cancer metastases, and then don't forget factitious intake. It's rare, but it's good to note and it's important to always take a drug history in patients with hypothyroidism. In terms of your HCG mediated, that would be your gestational uh, transient thyrotoxicosis, um, hyperemesis gravidarum, which is probably a, a severe form or, or symptomatic form of GTT, and then your gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. Don't forget your multiple pregnancies. Familial gestational hypothyroidism is extremely rare. It's been described in one family group, and there's multiple um, reports of, of that family group. So we're going to do a couple of cases just to illustrate what I've shown. So case one is a patient we saw here. She's a 26-year-old female, para-3, GRAF4, at 39 weeks gestation. She was known to endocrine with a thyroid problem, but then she was lost to follow-up between April last year and this year for obvious reasons. Um, she had palpitations, racing thoughts, hyperhidrosis, and she basically came in for delivery and was noted to have a neck mass. Borderline hypertensive, she was tachycardic when she came in. Um, systems examination was normal, but she did have a goiter and mild orbitopathy. And these were her blood results that were done. Um, normal UNE, her TSH is completely suppressed, and her T4 is 43.1, so above the um, upper limit of normal for pregnancy. So let's see if this works. We are going to give Zoom polls a try. So if you're watching this recording, you won't see the poll pop up, but if you're looking on your phone, tablet, or computer, you'll see these questions come up. So it's anonymous. Please go ahead and answer. Um, the question is, what's the diagnosis? Um, is it Graves' disease, hyperemesis gravidarum, autoimmune thyroiditis, or something else? And then what antithyroid treatment would you prescribe? So none, because antithyroid drugs are teratogenic. Give carbimazole, propylthiouracil, radio iodine ablation, or thyroidectomy. So I'm going to give it a bit of time. We've got some answers coming through. I'll share the results now, but um, Graves' disease is definitely taking the lead in terms of the diagnosis. I'm not saying it's right. Don't let me influence you. And then a variety of answers for the treatment. Okay, so let me share these results. So 79% of people who answered, we've got 19 people answered, thought it's Graves' disease. A um, couple thinking it's hyperemesis, some autoimmune thyroiditis. And then antithyroid treatment, majority leaning towards carbimazole, some propylthiouracil, I'll talk about that now. And then some saying none, antithyroid drugs are all teratogenic. Well, let's talk about Graves' disease in pregnancy. So it has a 3% incidence in um, the general female population versus a new onset incidence of 0.05% in pregnancy. So some cases of Graves' disease are diagnosed in pregnancy for the first time. These patients present with typical symptoms. So they have symptoms of hypothyroidism as well as a goiter and orbitopathy. And in terms of their biochemistry, they have a suppressed TSH and elevated T4 and TSH receptor antibodies are usually present. Something important to note is that your T3 to T4 ratio is quite useful, and it's usually more than 20 to 1 in Graves' disease. And the reason this is important is that if you compare Graves' and gestational transient thyrotoxicosis, which is, has new onset in pregnancy of between 2 and 11%, these patients don't, have a goit, don't develop a goiter and they don't develop orbitopathy, but they, do, they can have symptoms of hypothyroidism. Their TSH can be suppressed with an elevated T4, but they don't have TSH receptor antibodies. And the T3 to T4 ratio is usually less than 20 to 1. 
So these are all things you can use, the absence of a goiter and orbitopathy, no antibodies, and this T3 to T4 ratio to differentiate between the two. So that patient was, had Graves' disease, and she was at delivery, so she was delivered, but we'll talk more about the management of Graves' disease in pregnancy a bit later. So case two, a 28-year-old female, parrot 2 grave 3 at 10 weeks. She has no background medical history, and she comes in with a weak history of vomiting, weakness, fatigue, and malaise. Um, a bit hypotensive, could be normal for pregnancy, but she is tachycardic. Uh, systems are normal. She has no goiter, no eye signs, and the obstetricians have done an ultrasound and is a live singleton intrauterine pregnancy. These are her results. Um, normal FBC, her chloride is low, her potassium is low, and her urea and creatinine are elevated for pregnancy. TSH towards the low limit of normal, free T4 is, is elevated just above the upper limit of normal. So what's the diagnosis? Your options are Graves' disease, hyperemesis, autoimmune thyroiditis, or something else. Um, and the question is, should this patient receive antithyroid treatment? Okay, so it's definitely skewed towards one of these answers. Right, let's share that result. So yeah, majority of people voting towards hyperemesis gravidarum, which is the correct answer. Um, the patient had no goiter, no orbitopathy. Uh, we didn't have thyroid antibodies for her. And then, oh, sorry, let me share these results and show you. And yeah. Should the patient receive antithyroid treatment? No, probably not. One person's thinking, yes, she should. So hyperemesis affects 0 0.1 to 0.4% of pregnancies. It's nausea and vomiting that's associated with electrolyte imbalances, weight loss. Um, most um, authors quote a number of 5% of pre-pregnancy weight, dehydration. These patients have a low TSH, it's not completely suppressed. They have an elevated T4 and a markedly elevated beta, beta HCG. The TSH and T4 return to normal around 12 weeks. And these patients don't require treatment um, or antithyroid treatment, but beyond 12 weeks, um, if symptoms of hypothyroidism persist or there's a persistently low TSH, then the patient needs further investigation and possibly management. So the last case, case three, so the 36-year-old female, she's gravid at three, para two, on the basis of a positive urine pregnancy test. She has no background history, but she comes in with a day history of abdominal pain and spotting, as well as palpitations. And her last normal menstrual period was five to six weeks ago. She's quite well looking. Um, she doesn't really have any features of chronic illness. BP is normal. She's tachycardic. Cardiovascular and chest are normal. She's got mild suprapubic tenderness, but the pelvic ultrasound shows features in keeping with a complete molar pregnancy. And these are her results. She is anemic, UNE is normal. TSH on its way to being suppressed, T4 is up, but her beta HCG is 175,000. And just for reference, the normal at this gestational age would be about 1,000, between 1,000 and 56,000. It's a wide range, um, but that's definitely elevated. So she's assessed as a complete molar pregnancy. The plan is for a uterine evacuation in theater. And she's seen by the anesthetics team and they've asked for a medicine or endocrine consult to start antithyroid treatment before she goes in um, for her evac. So what are your thoughts in this patient? Just one question. How would you manage this patient? So she doesn't need any medical management, discharge from medicine, not for us to sort out. Uh, do you just give beta blockers, carbimazole and beta blockers, propyl thiouracil and beta blockers, or a thyroidectomy? There's, there's quite a split on this one, and it's definitely a debatable um, case. Not, not quite as clear cut as the others. Okay, so let me share these results. 
So the majority voting for carbimazole and beta blockers, a um, few people saying just beta blockers, some saying nothing, discharge her and propyl thiouracil and one brave person saying thyroidectomy, um, hopefully just to get a nice split of, of the answers. So this patient had gestational trophoblastic neoplasia and this is a spectrum of diseases ranging from a partial molar pregnancy to choriocarcinoma. Patients, don't, patients may have a goiter, but they don't have orbitopathy, although they may have symptoms of hypothyroidism. And they have a low TSH and elevated T4 and marked beta-HCG elevation. The treatment is delivery or, or removal of the molar pregnancy, um, and that usually resolves symptoms. In terms of preoperatively, Patients often don't require antithyroid treatment and they will get away with just beta blockers. And the reason for this is that antithyroid treatment takes about three to six weeks to actually work. And as I showed you in the physiology, we have a reserve of um, thyroid hormone of about two months, but this isn't, you know, this is a beta HCG mediated cause of hypothyroidism. And these patients do well, just usually just with beta blockers and then evacuation. So your treatment options. The aim in terms of mild hypothyroidism is to maintain mild hypothyroidism and prevent fetal hypothyroidism. The reason for this is that you may have fetal hypothyroidism with the normal maternal thyroid profile. So the American Thyroid Association recommends maintaining mild hypothyroidism, and that's the upper limit of normal for pregnancy or slightly higher. And then frequent monitoring, two to four weekly until stable on treatment, and then every four weeks thereafter. It's important to remember that thyroid autoimmunity may improve in the second trimester. So you might start on a specific dose and then actually have to come down in the second and third trimester. So who do we treat? Well, all patients with non-HCG mediated um, thyroid disease require treatment. And in those with HCG mediated, the only ones you might treat are those with gestational trophoblastic neoplasia um, for the reasons I explained uh, before. So the thionamides are your antithyroid drugs. Methimazole and carbimazole are essentially the same drug. Carbimazole is metabolized to methimazole. We don't have methimazole available and we don't have propyl thiouracil available. There's some debate still about the benefit of propyl thiouracil um, against carbimazole. It's propyl thiouracil um, has possibly has less teratogenic side effects, but a higher risk of liver failure. So what most authors will recommend is using propyl thiouracil in the first trimester and then carbimazole thereafter, but we don't have that option. So carbimazole is all we have. In terms of treatment, you want to aim for the lowest dose possible, 5 to 40 milligrams daily. Some will suggest 5 to 15 milligrams daily. It has a risk of congenital malformations. And then remember your side effects, um, agranulocytosis and hepatitis. In terms of teratogenicity, there's a number of teratogenic effects most notably aplasia cutis, which is the absence of the epidermis on the head. Um, it is more with methimazole, but it has been reported with carbimazole. And then tracheoesophageal fistulas, urinary tract defects on phalliceles and coanal atresia. In terms of studies proving teratogenic effects of carbimazole, there have been a number done. So in the UK, there were 57 cases reported um, over a 47-year period, um, which included 97 anomalies. There was no comparative group. Um, so it's just, just a number over 50 years. A Taiwanese study reported no anomalies, um, although only 73 patients in the study were on methimazole. A Japanese study done um, showed a 4.1% rate of um, congenital anomalies versus 2.1% in, in a population not receiving antithyroid drugs. A Danish study, and this is quite an amazing study, they did 817,000 live births, and they compared in the 1,820 exposed to thionamides, there was a threat or congenital anomaly rate of 9.1% versus 5.7% in those not exposed. A Swedish study of 684,000 live births um, strangely showed a lower rate of congenital anomalies in the antithyroid group versus the non-exposed group, although this was not statistically significant. Then a very large Korean study of 2.8 million deliveries um, showed a rate of 17.5% congenital anomalies in those on carbimazole versus 5.9% um, in those not. 
the numbers are obviously very different, 1,120 patients on carbamazole versus 2.8 million not on any antithyroid drugs. So it's quite a range, um, you know, very high in this study, quite low in this study, none in this study. So we know that this drug causes congenital anomalies, but at what rate is, can, is debatable. The reason it's important, oh, sorry, is that maternal complications of maternal hypothyroidism are important. There's an increased risk of preeclampsia, placental abruption, superimposed preeclampsia. And so most of these, or not most, but some of these patients may have hyper, hypertension, uh, preterm birth, and ICU admission. So an odds ratio of 3.7% for women with maternal hypothyroidism. In terms of fetal complications, well, there's a risk of IUGR. That's an odds ratio of 9.2. Uh, risk of neonatal hypothyroidism, low birth weight, cardiac failure in the neonate, preterm birth, and a high rate of NICU admission. So it's a balancing act. You have to think of the benefits to mom and in effect the benefits to baby, as well as the risks to baby in terms of congenital anomalies. So a bit on beta blockers. So beta blockers are recommended as symptomatic therapy in HCG induced thyroid toxicosis. So in that patient with a molar pregnancy, a beta blocker is useful to lower her heart rate, reduce her symptoms until the molar pregnancy can be removed. Um, and then you can monitor thyroid function thereafter. It can also be used as a bridge when starting thionamides. And as I said, you know, you have a, a pool of thyroid hormone and it's gonna take time for your thionamides to actually work. So you can use this again to reduce your symptoms. And then preoperatively, again, in your gestational trophoblastic neoplasia to prevent thyroid storm. The beta blockers we can use, uh, propranolol or metoprolol, but really only for a two to six week duration maximum because of the risk of fetal hypoglycemia, fetal bradycardia and IUGR. Atenolol is contraindicated because it has much higher risk of these, um, these effects. So that's it, just some take home points. Remember the physiology, it is important. Your TSH drops in early pregnancy, your total T3, T4 increase and your free T3, T4 remain essentially unchanged. Not all patients with hypothyroidism in pregnancy require treatment. But remember that, uh, it's not moving for some reason. Hypothyroidism carries a significant maternal and fetal risk and thionamides can be used in pregnancy, but you have to weigh up the risk versus the benefit and the, the risk in the mom and baby and the benefit in the mom and baby. And that's it. If you have any questions, any comments, I'd be happy to take them.